What is coevolution? Well, in the simplest formulation, it's really the reciprocal evolutionary effects that one species has on another species. And basically, through this interaction, evolutionary change happens. Species A evolves in response to some selective pressure by species B, and vice versa. Species B, because of this interaction, also could respond to the presence of species A, some activity, some interaction that species A causes to, uh, has to um, alter the fitness of species B. So when does coevolution occur? Well, the definition would say that those two species need to be interacting. And so the closer the ecological relationship, especially with a fitness difference, the more likely it is that coevolution will, uh, will actually occur. And usually this kind of close relationship happens between species that are specialists rather than between species that are generalists. This is a topic, uh, this is something that we're going to come back to uh, later on. And it's important to differentiate between the measurement and the study of coevolution at two different scales. One is on an ecological time scale that is within a generation or several generations and, the, the, and measuring the effects that species have on each other. And one is over evolutionary times, something that may happen over not only hundreds, but maybe thousands of generations uh, over perhaps even uh, millennia. And so at one end of the scale, you may be measuring things like survivorship, uh, host plant uh, um, selection uh, behavior, traits that may change and that make uh, insects or plants susceptible uh, or resistant to each other. And on the other end, you may be experiencing or you may be measuring things like the evolution of specialization, why things have broad diet breaths, uh, diversity of lineages, and so on. And we're going to take each one of these uh, two in, uh, in turn today. The roots of the study of coevolution really uh, started in about the middle of the, the last century. Some of the best examples that emerged at the time were having to do with what's often referred to as a gene-for-gene -gene interaction between plants uh, and fungal pathogens. That is, there was a pathogen and a plant had a single trait uh, governed by a single gene that resulted in the uh, resistance to that particular fungal pathogen. Because of the existence of that resistance trait, fungi that had uh, traits themselves that allowed them to overcome that resistance became adapted to that new type. And so there could be this gene-for-gene gene change between the host and the pathogen that allowed them to evolve in response to each other, breaking that resistance uh, in a sense. So this, these ideas were floating around in people's minds um, as tools to study uh, the pl plants uh, and their chemistry were becoming more and more um, common. As you heard in a previous lecture, uh, Gottfried Frankel, in trying to understand why there was this diversity of uh, chemistries uh, within plants, came to the realization or came uh, proposed an hypothesis that said that actually the reason for the existence of these plant secondary metabolites was not because of some garbage uh, waste products that they were creating, but it was actually because they conferred some level of defense against important selective agents like, uh, like herbivores. So Gottfried Frankel proposed basically a mechanism by which plants could actually defend themselves against insects and therefore could have a selective uh, advantage over others in a population that didn't have these particular traits. Ehrlich and Raven proposed a modification or kind of a next step uh, from this in a classic study that they were that uh, was entitled uh, Butterflies and Plants, a Study in Coevolution. And in this particular uh, uh, paper, they proposed a series of uh, potential steps that uh, through the interaction between plants and insects, you could get the evolution of different defensive chemistries and also the speciation of, um, of lineages, the diversification of lineages to the point where they could no longer uh, interbreed. And therefore, the, um, the radiation and the, uh, the uh, explosion of, uh, and therefore, the generation of new species because of the response of, one, uh, of a plant to an insect, for example.
Here's what Ehrlich and Raven actually uh, proposed. They basically said that either by uh, mutation or recombination, just by some, uh, some chance event, or by the mixing up of traits or of genes that were already there, angiosperms, that is flowering plants, could produce some new plant uh, substance, secondary uh, compound. Again, these are compounds that are not uh, serving a primary physiological role, but can serve these additional uh, roles, such as by mediating uh, interactions with other organisms. By chance, these new secondary substances can alter the suitability of plants uh, as food for, for insects. That is, insects may suffer some fitness disadvantage, and the corollary is that plants may be able to reproduce better because they're not getting eaten by these, these, uh, these insects. And therefore, plants being released by the constraints imposed by herbivory can undergo um, population growth, ad uh, inhabiting of uh, additional uh, niches or niches, depending on what you prefer, and enter what is sometimes referred to as a new adaptive zone. Now, this is kind of a little bit where the magic uh, happens. Ehrlich and Raven didn't really specify very much how this was supposed to happen, and there's been a lot of debate in uh, the scientific literature as to what evolutionary radiations, what the mechanism for causing these uh, evolutionary radiations actually is. But let's leave that aside for now. Now, likewise, by mutation or recombinations, insects can also evolve mechanisms that allow them to overcome these secondary uh, plant substances that were previously dragging them down, causing them to be sick, having lower fitness, and so on. Because any of those insects that just by chance had this now were at advantage over their, uh, um, the, their, the others in the population that didn't have these traits, and their genes are going to spread in the population. And therefore, they find all these food plants that are available to them that have no competitors uh, on them. And they're able to grow their populations and also radiate, speciate on them. They enter these new adaptive zones. And so it's this reciprocal evolutionary adaptive changes that plants and insects can have on each other that allows them to escape herbivory and then diversify, colonize new plants and then diversify in the absence of competitors, and so on and so on. And this is the so-called escape and radiate model of coevolution that Ehrlich and Raven uh, proposed. There's other models, but this is the one we're going to start with uh, today. And again, they implied a couple of different elements in this particular hypothesis, that there was reciprocal selection, herbivore puts some selective pressure on the plant, and the plant applies selective pressure on the herbivore. That actually is kind of the core strict definition of coevolution that there's a reciprocal adaptation, that is they both, both of the partners respond to each other's um, um, selection pressure, and that there's a stimulation of these speciation uh, events that allow them to, to, become, um, uh, to uh, become more species in the absence of uh, herbivory. And that's, as I said before, is a little bit where the uh, arm waving uh, actually happens in, in all this, the, the, the mechanisms of adaptive radiation. This again is uh, the escape, um, this is the model that Ehrlich and Raven proposed. The escalation and diversification uh, hypothesis is a modification of the Ehrlich and Raven. And uh, I think uh, Thompson was the, the one who actually uh, coined the escape and radiate uh, uh, terminology that embodied the Ehrlich and Raven um, approach. So what evidence is there that uh, is consistent with this kind of an hypothesis of reciprocal selective in, uh, uh, impacts and interactions that could lead to the diversification of plants and uh, insects. Going back to this question of why are groups like beetles so diverse, so speciose? An interesting observation is that over half of the beetles are phytophagous, that is, they feed on plants. And the large number of these herb herbivorous beetles actually feed on flowering plants. And flowering plants are the group of plants that are the most uh, diverse themselves. So when uh, um, the, a classic study by Brian Farrell uh, at the University of Maryland uh, at the time actually looked at the timing of the diversification of plants 
as inferred through the um, uh, through the geologic record, looking at fossils. How many new different kinds of plant species existed as you go back in time? And what was interesting is that uh, right around the um, uh, right around the, the Jurassic uh, here, uh, approximately uh, 60 million years ago, there was a very rapid uh, period of expansion, uh, increasing the number of species of, uh, of flowering plants. And you can see it uh, here. There was also some um, additional radiation that you can see, or additional speciation rates. There was also a period of increased um, uh, diversification here uh, during the, the tertiary, a much more recent uh, period. This was coincident with the timing of when beetles also started to diversify. So you can start seeing some um, synchrony between the diversification rates of plants and the diversification rates of, of insects, of herbivorous uh, beetles in particular. Now, what was interesting, um, the study that, that, that Farrell did, is he actually looked at the fact, what was interesting with, uh, with Farrell's study is that he uh, noticed that although beetles for the, for, as a group are a monophyletic group, that is, they all share the same common ancestor, they are not necessarily all specialized on feeding on uh, angiosperms, on flowering plants. Certain groups of the Phytophagus beetles feed on kind of ancient evergreens, the cycads. Some of them feed on conifers. Some of them feed on uh, angiosperms that are dicots. These are the flowering uh, uh, plants that are the most diverse. And some of them feed on uh, monocots, things like uh, lilies and onions and things like that. But one of the key observations that, uh, that Farrell made is that um, there are many more beetle groups, beetle genera, that occur in clades, in groups of plants, that actually feed on angiosperms. And not as many, uh, of not as many species, or genera in this case, an indicator of diversification, for those that feed on conifers and cycads that did not have that same great rate of uh, diversification during the, um, during the late Cretaceous and uh, Jurassic. When Farrell looked at the uh, number of, um, oops, when Farrell then compared sister groups within the, the beetles um, that either fed on um, non-angiosperms compared to those that fed on angiosperms, the pattern is even uh, more striking. It's a little hard to read like this, but in parentheses here are the number of uh, it's a little hard to read here, but uh, you can see the number of genera that are found within uh, the groups that are here in green that are non-angiosperms um, versus the ones here in purple that are angiosperm feeding. And you can see without even me showing you that you know the groups that had um, uh, that were feeding on the angiosperms were significantly more speciose than the ones that were feeding on the non-angiosperms. And here you can see another one in uh, this red box here, species in the groups that were not feeding on angiosperms, eight and 18, compared to ones that have 3,000, 300, 2,000, 8,000 species in those groups. So when you look at the um, groups this is a uh, simplified version. This is a simplified version right here. Here's the groups that feed on angiosperms, much more speciose than the sister groups that were feeding on the non-angiosperms. And this was repeated multiple times over the evolutionary uh, phylogeny of, of beetles. Again, lending some support to the idea that association with flowering plants that were undergoing rapid uh, speciation was also associated with rapid speciation of the hosts uh, themselves. So certainly consistent with the idea of adapt, uh, adaptation and radiation that we see that uh, Ehrlich and Raven had, uh, had hypothesized. So what about the other components of the uh, Ehrlich and Raven system? That is, that there was an escalation of uh, defensive uh, chemistries. Now, mind you, the, the terminology here was uh, very typical of the time. 
uh, Ehrlich and Raven were reading and working and uh, writing about these uh, these topics during the Cold War era. So this is idea of uh, escalation of defenses that governments were uh, doing in response to each other. Um, if the Russians have uh, three nukes, well, then we'd better have five. And if the Americans have five, then we better have 10 and so on and so on. The same kind of mentality was brought to bear on these uh, ecological systems here. Well, one person that made uh, an, some incredible uh, insights and inroads in this particular uh, area was uh, Professor uh, May Berenbaum. Uh, May was a uh, just starting uh, faculty member at the University of Illinois. I'm showing her here in a picture from uh, 2014 uh, next to uh, President Barack Obama when she received the uh, Presidential Medal of Science uh, in large part because of her contributions to our understanding about the evolution and diversification uh, of insects. Uh, but at the time she was a, a young professor uh, at the University of Illinois. I had the great fortune to actually take uh, her insect ecology class uh, when I was an undergraduate uh, with her in the, in the late 80s. And uh, May made the, uh, the observation that um, there was a relationship between um, the toxicity and the complexity of certain secondary compounds in the, uh, that are present in, in some plants and the association of caterpillars, uh, butterflies, that, uh, that fed on those uh, particular uh, on those particular uh, plants that had those compounds. And these compounds belong to a group uh, that shared the same general uh, motif here the, uh, that started with this very simple uh, carbon aromatic uh, ring with a couple of oxygens uh, right here, um, a uh, molecule called coumarin. Uh, a hydroxylation of this uh, position here and adding of this group here make them, makes them hydroxycoumarins. You can then loop this piece here with a couple of more carbons to make a linear furanocoumarin. Now there's a furan ring, which is this thing uh, here, and it's in this linear position. And other plants, on the other hand, on the other hand flip this ring over so that it kind of closed on this side, so that it's a so-called angular furanocoumarin. So, uh, these were uh, compounds that were starting to be uh, mapped and um, dis uh, discovered and then mapped in, uh, in plants. And May made the observation that, uh, that the hydroxycoumarins, which were maybe the simplest way that you can kind of take that original motif um, of coumarin and make it a little more uh, complex, was actually present in a lot of different families. Three dozen families, including uh, plants like licorice here in the bean family, uh, lavenders, which are in the mint family, the rubiaceae here, the um, uh, bedstraw uh, family, and lots of different butterflies uh, and their caterpillars actually feed on these, uh, on these uh, chemicals. You might even recognize this one here, warfarin. Warfarin is a blood thinner uh, that is used for uh, treating um, people with uh, strokes or uh, heart attacks, and it keeps the blood flowing so it doesn't clot in your, um, in your arteries. And uh, if you recognize here, Wharf is actually one of the buildings that we have here on campus, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation building. This was a compound that was actually uh, pot patented and uh, isolated and patented here at the University of Wisconsin. If we look at the um, distribution of linear franocoumarins, so this is the hydroxy group that now has been flipped over right, right here, you only find it present in about a dozen plant species. Uh, primarily, um, one of the most common um, uh, plants that has these is poison hemlock. Uh, so hydroxycoum, uh, I'm sorry, linear franocoumarins are toxic, uh, toxic to humans as well. Poison hemlock was what Socrates uh, drank a brew of to commit suicide back in the Greek, uh, Greek times. Don't drink poison hemlock, don't eat it. Uh, on the other hand, species like the black swallowtail, this is an old world swallowtail uh, present in, uh, in Europe, uh, part of the McCann group, uh, has the ability to feed on these plants. And again, mind you, it's the caterpillars that are doing the feeding. The adults uh, don't do all that much but uh, nectar and uh, lay their eggs. And then one of the interesting things about linear, linear furanocoumarins here is that in the presence of light, they have the ability of cross-linking uh, the base pairs that are present in DNA. So here's one of the base pairs uh, here, 
Remember, they have the T, C, G, uh, A uh, base pairs that form the, uh, the codes of our uh, genetic, um, uh, our, of our genetic uh, signals. And uh, with the, the presence of these, um, with, and what foranocoumarins can do is actually bind to, to them and actually lock themselves into the double-stranded piece of DNA, preventing replication and um, uh, translation from actually uh, uh, happening. And so these can be actually quite uh, damaging to DNA, this cross-linking uh, phenomenon, and quite toxic as a result. And uh, uh, angular foranocoumarins uh, also have uh, this property. And the angular foranocoumarins are only present in three plant families, the Apiaceae, the Rutaceae, and the Fabaceae. The Apiaceae, again, are things like uh, carrots, uh, parsnips, uh, like this, uh, hemlocks. Uh, used to be the um umbellifer family. They have these umbel-like uh, flowers here. The Rutaceae is uh, citrus. The Fabaceae are uh, the legumes, the uh, bean, uh, bean family. And uh, like, uh, as you can imagine, there are some uh, herbivores like these uh, short-tailed uh, swallowtails here uh, that can feed on these particular plants. Now, what's, what's interesting here is that you... What's interesting in these patterns that uh, that Dr. Baerbaum was was able to document is that you have a class of compounds that are relatively common that occur across a lot of species, and then there were uh, derivations of that chemistry that were simply uh, de dependent on some enzymes that could kind of flip the bond the bonds of those uh, of those particular hydroxy uh, groups. Uh, that created more and more toxic um, derivatives, and fewer and fewer herbivores were able to uh, be able to uh, colonize those plants and persist on them. Again, consistent with the ideas of the Ehrlich and Raven. So uh, the Ehrlich and Raven, um, consistent with the ideas of the Ehrlich and Raven uh, hypothesis. Now, one of the neat things that uh, May and her group was able to do is that they actually found that the groups of uh, caterpillars that actually were able, the groups of butterflies, uh, who were able to detoxify some of these compounds uh, had a class of detoxification enzymes in a family called the cytochrome P450s. These are membrane-bound gut enzymes that have the capacity to actually break off or to put on actually uh, water uh, uh, that have the capacity to uh, put on uh, hydroxyl groups onto these molecules to make them more water soluble and get them out of their uh, get them out of their body quickly, and this xanthotoxin uh, metabolism xanthotoxin is one of those uh, coumarin uh, there um, varies across uh, caterpillar uh, uh, genotypes. So some genotypes are really able to detoxify them, whereas others are not able to detoxify them uh, very much, suggesting that they have a genetic basis. So here now, there's a mechanism, a detoxification enzyme, that is able to overcome those defenses and has the potential to be under selective uh, advantage. These families here should be at a greater advantage compared to these families here. And if that association is very strong, these um, uh, those traits will uh, become more widespread in the population. And so uh, kind of in a, in a classical uh, interpretation of Berenbaum's uh, scenario, there was again the uh, ancestral form of the cumaric acids, the hydroxyl groups attached to the coumarins, the uh, creating of the fur uh, uh, furan group onto the coumarin, uh, and then the angular form of that, which made them more and more toxic. And whereas most papillionids could deal with the cumaric acids, fewer and fewer species could actually deal with the more derived forms like the uh, angular uh, furanocoumarins. Now there have been uh, there's been a lot of work done. Now there's been a lot of work done uh, since the the late 80s on this particular uh, topic, even with the particular system that Dr. Rarenbaum uh, worked on, um, studying the mechanisms uh, and proposing alternative hypotheses that actually may create the same kind of pattern uh, as you may see here. And we're going to get to that uh, in a little bit and kind of a critique of some of the data that supports. Uh, 
a critique of the data that is used to support this uh, model of coevolution between herbivores and their plants. But let me give you one more uh, example, which is a very nice uh, example here. Uh, this was a study done by uh, Judith uh, Becerra. Um, she uh, was a... Uh, uh, let me give you another example here of a very nice study. Let me give you another example here of a very nice study done by uh, Judith Becerra uh, at the University of Arizona. Uh, and she was studying uh, a group of flea beetles. Uh, these are chrysomelids um, in the genus uh, Blepharida. And uh, these are um, uh, exist in a, throughout the uh, old world uh, tropics, kind of central Africa, but also in the new world tropics. And they feed on a group of uh, leguminous uh, plants uh, in this genus Bursera. And one of the neat things about these uh, Bursera species is they're chock full of um, terpenoid uh, uh, compounds, and you heard about that in, uh, in our previous uh, lesson. And some of the plants actually uh, keep these uh, compounds under very high pressure, such that when the veins are cut, they will actually squirt out, uh, kind of like a fire hose, uh, the compounds uh, at the at whatever it is that, that was feeding on it, kind of shooting a, a mouthful of kind of caustic, nasty, um, chemicals into their into their face. And here you can see one of these kind of squirting uh, Bursera uh, species here. And these caterpillars have evolved a series of uh, tricks to kind of overcome these particular defenses. Some of our, some are behavioral and some are actually physiological uh, as well. And what uh, uh, Bursera was able to do was actually look at, develop a phylogeny, an evolutionary, a reconstructed evolutionary history of the beetles here, uh, the blepharid uh, um, herbivores. And again, each one of these branching nodes kind of shows a family of related, uh, of related uh, species. And these are the most recent common ancestors. And she was also able to kind of reconstruct the, um, the time of the split based on a molecular uh, clock. And she, was, uh, and she did the same for the plant uh, groups, uh, for the, and she did the same for the plant phylogeny, where the Bursera uh, history, evolutionary history, was kind of derived from uh, some information based on their, uh, their DNA. And what you can see here, and one of the things you can see here in the uh, red and the in the pink are groups of Bursera that are uh, that have the squirting uh, traits, uh, and the ones in the green here are the ones that have these complex chemistries of these nasty uh, terpenoid uh, compounds, and they're in two very different groups within uh, the the genus uh, Bursera. There's one that's over here, and there's one uh, that's over here. And uh, this species here that knows how to deal with these uh, squirters uh, is uh, related to the ones that know how to deal, know that have evolved ways of actually um, developing, uh, of that have evolved ways to actually detoxify the nasty compounds that are present in some of these more uh, derived uh, lineages here. And here are some actually that have these behavioral traits that allow them to trench uh, the leaves so as to overcome the, um, the squirting pathways that some of them uh, have. And what you can see here is that there's a lot of convergence and crisscrossing of these lines, suggesting that um, there is not necessarily a strict evolutionary kind of lockstep changes between uh, the plants and the insects, uh, but there are traits that then uh, allow certain groups that have, that have kind of unlocked, uh, that, uh, uh, that have un unlocked the mechanisms for how to overcome those defenses that allowed them to colonize all of these different uh, species here. So back to the uh, Ehrlich and Raven uh, scenario, if there is this continual evolution, co-evolution between uh, insects uh, and uh, plants, what you would expect is that there could be a variety of ways in which plants could escalate uh, their defenses. They can either increase 
uh, the concentration of the uh, the compounds. Uh, they can either have more different kinds of compounds that would make them more toxic as an ensemble. Uh, they might actually have uh, compounds coming from very different body biosynthetic pathways. So imagine ones that have very different modes of actions that would challenge the detoxification machinery of the insects uh, much more so. Um, and they could produce completely novel uh, compounds or strategies that are, uh, that are new to the group uh, as a whole, or all of those uh, things. And the longer this interaction uh, takes place between these uh, herbivores and these plants, the more of these you would expect to get uh, over time. And what uh, uh, Becerra showed was actually, if you use the number of branching points as, a, as an indicator of how old an association may be, how many times uh, has, uh, has kind of diversification actually happened, whether you're looking at uh, the bean family or at this aster family, that there seems to be an association between the time of relationship between the plants and the, uh, and the insects and things like the number of different types of alkaloids. These are nitrogen uh, containing compounds or the diversity of those compounds uh, over time like this. And the same thing here for plants uh, and, uh, and their defenses in the Fabaceae and, uh, and the same thing here for plants, uh, for the number of compounds and the diversity of those compounds for plants in, in the Fabaceae. So the longer they're in association with those uh, specialized herbivores, the more likely you get this diversification of, uh, of these chemistries. So taken together, that the mechanisms that were proposed by Ehrlich and Raven are actually observed in some of these lineages, that there is more rapid diversification of, uh, of lineages of both insects and plants, uh, and that, um, that there's fewer and fewer insects that have been able to kind of overcome these defenses, these more specialized defenses, all point in this direction that yes, there's something special about the interaction between insects and plants that allow them to reciprocally respond to each other, and this may have an associate, this may have an effect on the rates of speciation uh, between them. Now, one of the big critiques of uh, these kinds of uh, studies is that just because you see a pattern that makes it look like the phylogenies, the evolutionary histories of the insects kind of match very neatly to the evolutionary history of the plants does not necessarily imp imply causation. And causation is really the key thing that's involved in our understanding of whether coevolution is happening, whether there's reciprocal uh, evolutionary responses of an insect to a plant. And in fact, speciation may just be incidental to the fact that these organisms may be occurring in the same area. Maybe they colonized uh, a particular uh, place after some kind of vicarious event, maybe there was a, a, a ridge of mountains or a lake or some kind of uh, division, large body of water that prevented one population from interbreeding with another one. And that in and of itself is what created uh, divergence of these lineages so that they became reproductively isolated and could not interbreed and therefore became new species. And that plants and insects did this independently and it just so looks like they have these same patterns because they did it in response to a third variable that had nothing really to do with the interaction uh, between them. So this is the so-called kind of allopatric model of speciation where divergence happens because there's just lack of reproductive uh, um, opportunities between these two populations that given enough time, thousands, millions of years, become reproductively uh, self-incompatible and that's when you get uh, the evolution of, of new species. And so for coevolution to happen, there needs to be causality. This says causal, not casual uh, here. So it's causal cospeciation is really what you need for uh, coevolution, not incidental cospeciation, which is just the speciation because two things happen to be in the same place responding to the same environment, but not really because of the interactions uh, between them. And really, one of the challenges of kind of studying this macro uh, level patterns is that causality is very difficult to actually uh, suss out. So in the next lecture, what we're going to look at 
is what are what is some of the evidence that points to the possibility that some of these genetic changes could actually be happening in ecological time.